Well, what is Christianity? Well, let me just tell you that God only gave one religion. He gave Judaism to the Jews, the Mosaic system. That's the only religion he ever gave, the only religion he will ever give. Well, what about Christianity? Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a person. Yes. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, before I get started this morning, I want to take just a moment to tell you what our Lord thought about dead religion. In his early ministry, he told the scribes and the priests and the Pharisees, he says, Make not my father's house a den of thieves. Then at the end of his ministry, he concluded by saying, your house is left unto you desolate. And he turned around and he walked out and he turned his back on religion. When religion rejected our Lord, our Lord turned to individuals. He gave up on religion. He said to them then, and he says to us today, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yes. He says, take my yoke upon ye and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, yes. and ye shall find rest for your soul. Mm -hmm. So now that we understand that Christianity is not a religion, but it's a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to speak today on some of the things concerning the man of whom we are talking about. And let me just say, first of all, Linda didn't hit me. I scratched myself with this razor this morning. I cut myself. Uh, that would have been about the fifth time she'd hit me, but no. I <laughs> but everybody says, you know, you're bleeding. I said, yeah, that razor gets ahead of me sometimes. I cut myself, but I want, I want to tell you that of all the sermons that I've prepared in the last three years, this has been by far the hardest sermon that I've ever tried to put together. Bless you, Lord. I've read Matthew, I've read Mark, I've read Luke, I've read John, I've read all the accounts concerning the crucifixion, and there is so much there that it is so hard to confine it, to, to, to put it into a little cup, if you will, and to bring out what I want to bring out. If you would, would turn with me to Luke chapter 9 this morning. Luke chapter 9, and I'll begin right there in verse 51. And we'll pick up the story just a few days before the crucifixion. Actually, about a week. And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. That was the Lord's will. The Lord knew that it was his last week on this earth in this body. So he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Did you notice the rejection by the Samaritans? When we think of Samaritans, we think of the good Samaritan in the proverb. But these were not good Samaritans. These were no more lovely than the Jews. They rejected him the same as the Jews rejected him. Now, the disciples wanted to do one thing, but Jesus wanted to teach them a lesson that only comes from personal experience. It says, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, 
Wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. You are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Amen. The Lord Jesus had to teach his apostles, his disciples, a lesson. I didn't come to destroy man. No. I come to save man. Save. Yes. To seek and to save that which was lost. So they went to another village. You see, James, it wasn't just James and John that didn't understand. It was all the apostles. None of them understood why the Lord Jesus came the first time. They all thought that he came to set up the kingdom, which he did. But because of the rejection, he had to leave the Jews and go to the Gentiles. Go to the individuals to establish his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now before, and I'm, I'm and I, when I study this, I, I think of a football game. You know, you watch a game, a replay on, on television. It says, because of time constraints, we're going to fast forward to the third quarter. Well, the time, because of time constraints, we're going to fast forward to going to Jericho. So Jesus left the Samaritan village and he, the Bible says he must pass through Jericho. He went there so he could lead a man that made his living by cheating people out of their homes and out of their property. Mm -hmm. It was a small man stature by the name of Zacchaeus and he was a tax collector. And he was a Jew that had lost his privilege to receive mercy at the mercy seat in the temple. Because you see, when they become a tax collector, they are excluded from the temple. Not allowed to go in there. So he could not go to the mercy seat and receive mercy. But Christ knew his heart. And he's going to Jericho and he looks up into that sycamore tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down or we must abide in your house today. Yes. So he goes and he teaches Zacchaeus that he is the mercy seat. Those that come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Mm -hmm. And he taught him a wonderful lesson. And the Bible said, well, he said to him, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus was lost, but Zacchaeus believed in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Zacchaeus and his whole house became believers that day. Now Jesus is going to go from Jericho into the city of Jerusalem. Now if you read the four Gospels, you'll find out that he actually went to Jerusalem three days in a row. He did not spend a night in Jerusalem in those three days. This is a week prior to the crucifixion. He goes in first time, according to Mark chapter 11, verse 11, on a Saturday, which is the Sabbath day. And he goes into the city and he goes into the temple and he finds that there are no money changers there. So he simply looked around and he left. Mark 11, 11 speaks it this way. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he looked around about upon all things, and now the evening tide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. He entered that first day as the priest. The next day he goes again. Now the next day is Sunday, the first day of the week. And the money changers were there. And we all know what he did. He turned over the tables and he ran them out. And you'll find that in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. He entered the, the city and the temple that day as the king. Mm -hmm. The third time he went in was on a Monday, which is the second day of the week. 
And the Bible says that he wept over Jerusalem and entered the temple and taught the people and healed the people. You'll find that in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. He went in that day as the prophet. So he went in three separate days as prophet, priest, and king into Jerusalem. And every night he would leave and go to either Bethphage or Bethany and spend the night. So when he goes back to Jerusalem, uh, that's when they start to crucify him. It all started on that second day of the week when he went in there to start teaching and healing the people in the temple. Then the priests and the rabbis and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes all got into an uproar because he had just turned over their little cart. Mm -hmm. Let me say here that Jesus told the Jews that if they had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from their eyes. Jesus said, listen, if you would have known what you had, you would have had it all. But you didn't know. So now they are hid from your eyes. He told them that they would go through total and utter destruction, which they did. And you know why he told them that? Why would they would go through utter and total destruction? Watch this. <coughs> because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Amen. They didn't know that God was among them. <coughs> they didn't know that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They didn't know that he was God manifested in the flesh. <coughs> the day of thy visitation they didn't know. Listen, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart this morning, be very careful and don't pass up the day of this visitation. Yes, it's yes. It's a dangerous thing. Yes. You could experience utter destruction. Do not pass up the day of his visitation. So now we find Jesus being ridiculed by the priests and by the Pharisees and by the scribes and by the Sadducees and even the Romans at this point. I'm of the opinion that there were probably not over a handful of people who actually knew what was about to take place. That he was going to be crucified. That he was going to die. And in three days he was going to raise again. So we find numerous people here that are trying to set a trap to the Lord Jesus to find some thought that they could kill him, that they could have him persecuted. Now, you got to remember that the Jews were under Roman captivity, if you will. Jurisdiction belonged to the Romans. The Jews' method of killing people was stoning, as evidenced by Stephen. But the Roman way of execution was by crucifixion. Mm -hmm. They knew, the Old Testament says, person is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. Mm -hmm. They wanted him to be crucified. They not only wanted him killed, they wanted him cursed. They wanted the worst thing in the world that could happen to him to happen to him. Now, they start out questioning Jesus. And they question his authority. By what authority do you do these things? By what authority do you heal these people? By what authority do you teach this gospel? He says, well, let me ask you a question. Did John the Baptist come from heaven? Or did he come from man? They knew that either way they answered, they were a loser. So the Bible says they answered him not. He shut them up with a question. Then they tried to get him on not paying tribute to Caesar. 
And they said, should we pay tribute to Caesar or should we pay tribute to God? And he looks at him and says, you give unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. And you give unto God that which belongs to God. So again, they struck out. Jesus basically shut them all up just by asking them questions because they couldn't answer. They had no answer. So we know that the Jews couldn't do what they wanted to do in crucifying, crucifying him because they, they could only stone him but they only, and they had to have the Romans approval to do that and they couldn't get it. We all know the story where they took him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Caiaphas takes him to Pilate. Pilate takes him to Herod. Herod sends him back to Pilate. They do everything they can do. Pilate says, listen, his wife comes to him and says, I, I had a dream. He said, don't do anything to this innocent man. He's not guilty of anything. Pilate goes out and says, listen, I, I, can't, I can't do anything. I find no fault in this man. So the custom in that day was to turn over on the Passover someone that was guilty of treason, murder, whatever, fraud, right, bribery. <coughs> there was one there by the name of Barabbas that was a very bad crook, and he knew it. So he asked the people, he says, I find no fault with him. So who, he thought he could get away. He said, you know, in his heart he knew they'd pick to let Christ go and, and send Barabbas because he was guilty. He says, who do you want me to let go on this day of freedom? And they all shouted, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. Give us Barabbas. They all yelled in unison. <coughs> Crucify this innocent man. Give us this guilty man. Now, we find that they took him and they took him to the Sanhedrin and put him on trial. Now, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 22. I want to pick the story up. Luke chapter 22. Verses 1 through 5. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes saw how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Issacharius, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the <coughs> captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. For well, 30 pieces of silver, Judas goes and says, I will turn him over to you, but I can't do it in a public place. He goes to Gethsemane to pray all the time. He'll be there tonight. They said, well, how do we know who he is? He says, I will betray him with a kiss. Mm -hmm. The one that I kiss upon the cheek, that is the Savior. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the one that you want. So they said, okay. They gave him his 30 pieces of silver. So they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and we know the story where Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus, and Jesus picks it up and heals it. But they take him in, and he's found guilty. And they're going to crucify him and put him to death. Now, I was really, you know me, I like to pick out something small in here and make something out of it. If you read this story, you'll find out, and in, in, go over with that one to verse 63 in chapter 22. It says, and the men that helped Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is this that smote thee? And many other things, blasphemy, did they speak against him. 
But we learn in verse 54 before that happened, it says, Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Let me tell you, it's a dangerous thing to follow the Lord afar off. Yes. You saw what happened to Peter. The rest of the disciples was up there close. Peter was afar off around the fire. And the lady says, hey, he's one of them. He's there. He, he runs with him. He's one of that, that crowd. He says, I know not the man. Hey, I'm telling you, he's one of, I know not the man. I mean, he put a few adjectives in there. He's a cursing. She said again, I know I've seen you with him. I'm telling you, I don't know that man. <laughs> Jesus had told him that before the cock crew, he would deny him three times. Yeah. Because he was following him afar off. We ought to stay close to our Savior. Yes. Now, I just read where they beat him to a pulp. Mm -hmm. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to close your eyes and keep them closed for just a moment, if you will, till I say to open it. And when we open them, not yet, I want us to look at the cross and picture our Savior on that cross, beaten, battered, black and blue. He did it all for me, and he did it all for you. You know, technology is wonderful when it works. And sometimes it doesn't work. But I want you to open your eyes now and I want you to look at the cross. I want you to see your Savior hanging on that cross. Isaiah said that his visage was so marred that you couldn't tell he was a man. You could not recognize him because they had beat him so viciously. They had whipped his front side and his backside and had slapped him in the face. They played games with him and hit him with their fists and said, now you tell us who hit you. They thought it was funny. But he, like a lamb to the slaughter, said not a word. He took it all and hung on that cross for three hours, beaten, battered, black and blue. If you would, close your eyes for me one more time. We see him mocking him. We can hear him mocking him. If thou be the Christ, come down and save thyself. You saved others. Why not save yourself? If you be the Christ, call 10,000 angels and let them come down and take you off of that cross. Now we see Christ in the last three hours paying the price for our sin. The Bible says that he shed his blood, his precious blood. And it says that there was total darkness at that time for three hours. He did it all for you and me. I believe that the reason there was total darkness because God didn't want us to see the agony and the pain that the Lord Jesus Christ went through those last three hours to pay for our wretched, sinful Amen. lives. Amen. I want you to open your eyes now. I want you to look at that cross. And I want you to see the blood set coming from the crown of thorns on his head, coming from the cat of nine tail lashes on his back, coming from every orifice of his body where they had beaten him. He did it all for you 
and for me. I want you to close your eyes one last time. And I want you to think and remember the story that when they took him off of that cross, they took him to the tomb of which no man had ever laid, owned by Joseph of Arimathea. And they laid him in that tomb. And on the third day, the first day of the week, came Mary and the other women running to the sepulchre to bring spices. And when they get there, they saw that the stone was rolled away. Now, in just a few seconds, when you open your eyes and you look at that cross, I want you to say in, in unison, he's alive, he's alive, because he is alive forevermore. You can open your eyes. Let's say it. He's alive. He's alive. You know where he went? After he spent three days in the bosom of the earth, he ascended to the Father, where he says he sat down on the right hand of God, ever making intercessions for us. He sat down, the Bible says, by power and with great glory. Listen, he did it all just for you and just for me. Amen. I'm of the opinion that if I had been the only person on this earth that needed saving, he would have died just for me. Yes. I hope this morning that you can leave this building saying what the Roman centurion said after after they had stuck the spear into his side after he had died they stuck the spear into his side to make sure there was no more blood in there but the Roman centurion looked at that cross and he said surely this was the Son of God. If you don't know him this morning, if you've never accepted him as your Savior, today is the day of your salvation. Today is the perfect day. What a better time. What a testimony you'd have for the rest of your life to say, I was saved on Easter Sunday morning. The day that we celebrate the time that he paid it all just for me. Let's all stand and sing. I hear the Savior say thy strength indeed is strong child of weakness watch and pray find in me thy
I love that song because he lives. Yes. Marty, what a beautiful song you sang. Thank you so much. I know that my Redeemer lives. Listen, he lives. He lives. He's ever making intercessions for us. Amen. I hope you have a wonderful Easter. Kids, don't run off. We're going to have a little Easter egg hunt out here for the children. I think uh, it's a... Huh? Tim's got it. They're, if they'll go downstairs... Uh, where is Ann? Sharon went downstairs. He's on the... Okay. Yeah. I think she wants him to come downstairs. Okay, if you go downstairs, and uh, we'll go from there. Please don't forget, tonight is the first night of the revival. From Craig Edwards starting at 6 o'clock. We will be having uh, sandwiches and soup tonight after the service to uh, welcome Brother Craig and, and hopefully Linda's going to get to come with him. Uh, so please make an effort to be here. Bring a friend, especially if you have a friend that's lost. Bring him that the man of God can preach the word of God. The Holy Spirit of God can save them of their sin and convict them. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Brother Jerry, would you just miss us in prayer? Father, we're so grateful for this privilege to have your presence this morning, to have this day, to know what it represents to us. The picture, Lord, that we've been painted to us this morning about the awful death that you died just for me. And for all that will accept you as their Savior, I praise you, Lord. That you completed that by resurrecting on that third day as we celebrate Easter this morning. Bless everything that's among us. Be with us in revival this week. I pray that you touch hearts that may be lost this morning and see heaven song and somewhere that they'll come up and trust you. We give you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good day and God bless you.